Okay, so thank you, uh, thank you very much um, for introducing me. Uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers, not just for uh, inviting me to this wonderful workshop and thematic program, but also for um, giving me the opportunity to give my talk uh, online. I very much appreciate this. Um, so the, the talk will be about, uh, yes, indeed, higher structures uh, on two levels in the story of deforming, non deforming spaces into non-commutative counterparts. Um, so let's say higher structures occur in two, uh, two main ways. Uh, on the one hand, on the, the complexes describing these deformations, and then on the other hand, on the objects you're deforming. Uh, and so I will start with an overview and then uh, zoom in on a particular model for spaces, namely pre-stacks and recent joint work with Hoang Din Van and Lander Hermans uh, on, on the pre-stack case, if you like. So um, let me start with a general setup or general guiding question, if X is a scheme, uh, then we can wonder how should we deform X. Now there's an associated Hochschild cohomology, um, which is, can be expressed as, a, as an X of the diagonal bimodule uh, of, the, of the scheme. And then in the smooth case, there's a famous Hochschild kostad rosenberg decomposition, uh, whereby the second Hochschild cohomology has these three uh, famous components. Um, and then, I mean, one, uh, one way uh, to look at this, for instance, in the, con in the context of mirror symmetry, uh, Konsevich in his uh, 1994 ICM address suggested that we should see this as, well, tangent to um, a, a kind of extended moduli space of uh, non-commutative spaces. And so then the question, well, one can guess, of course, what these three components are. The middle one we know very well. These are just the, the commutative scheme deformations. And then, um, then we also have um, the, the, the non-commutative deformations on the left and the Jerby deformations on the right. And so then the question is um, how, I mean, how do you deform in an algebraically precise way? So what we are going to do is associate algebraic objects to the scheme X and then try to deform them to obtain these non-commutative uh, deformations. Okay, so, um, it makes sense to start with the easiest cases of schemes, namely uh, affine schemes. And there, so if X is a spec of A, in fact, A is a commutative algebra, but we can forget about commutativity right away here because the associated cohomology theory of Hochschild cohomology works for any K algebra, it can be non-commutative. And this is, of course, a well-known theory, um, computing X groups of bimodules, uh, well-known since the work of Gerstenhaber in the 60s to uh, govern deformation theory, algebraic deformation theory, where in the easiest, uh, in the easiest case, uh, to, a, to a Hochschild 2 co-cycle phi, we associate a deformed multiplication uh, where we take the, the original multiplication plus phi epsilon for some parameter epsilon squaring to zero. And then also the, the Hochschild cohomology is known to have higher structure. It's a Gerstenhaber algebra. And then things become more um, complicated when we look at the higher structure of the actual Hochschild complex. And uh, a very insightful treatment of this was given by Gerstenhaber and Voronov, uh, who actually discussed this structure in a two-step process. So uh, 
at the beginning, you, you don't even have to assume that it's an algebra you're working with. A can be just a K module or vector space, so vector space if you're over field. Um, and then this uh, Hochschild complex, it doesn't have a differential yet, uh, but it's really just an endomorphism operat of this, of this module. And it can be, it is endowed with these operatic compositions. And it's really these operatic compositions that entail then that more, more familiar, maybe higher structure like the dot product dot product which is obtained by inserting one linear map into another one and then filling the open spots with uh, with identities okay so uh, and then we move to the second stage of the process and this is when the multiplication comes in so now the the, the module acquires algebraic structure a multiplication and then this multiplication satisfies an instance of the maurer cartan equation, namely m dot m equal to zero. And this fact further entails uh, all, all these other nice uh, operations that we have, uh, in particular the Gerstenhaber bracket, bracket and, the, and the Hochschild differential. So this is like an ideal setup. And uh, I, I will maybe refer to this as an, a kind of elementary deformation setup. So, uh, wh what is it, wh what is this? Um, suppose we have an algebraic object. So it comes equipped. It, these are some modules uh, with some operations on and between them, satisfying some axioms. And then there is an. So we're, we're looking for an associated graded object a priori which is itself endowed with operations. And then there is like a checklist of three things that we, we certainly want. Uh, it's kind of the, the, the basic nice situation for deformation theory. First thing is that in, in degree two, the components should precisely capture the algebraic structure. Okay. Secondly, we want to have a, well, a, a complex, or at least we want higher structure on this graded object, which induces an underlying DGLA or maybe L infinity structure so that we can observe the Maurer Cartan equation. And then uh, the situation is very nice if um, this algebraic structure alpha, which we put onto these modules, this has to satisfy the Maurer Cartan equation precisely when the axioms for the structure are fulfilled. And this is a kind of a perfect setup because then the whole deformation theory kind of flows automatically uh, from this, uh, from this uh, starting point. And then the third ingredient is, of course, the cohomology. We want the cohomology of the resulting complex to be a, a, a nice invariant uh, of the of the object we're looking at. Okay, so there are some possible approaches uh, that are more sophisticated to realize this kind of setup. For instance, looking at operatic deformation complexes or uh, looking at generalized versions of the Deligne conjecture, because the structure I mentioned earlier on, the homotopy G algebra stru structure on the, I, I forgot to mention it, but that it was on my slide, which is on the classical Hochschild complex. This can be considered as a stepping stone towards the Delinear conjecture. But we won't be dis dis discussing these much today. So most of the talk will be about the elementary deformation setup. Okay. So let's turn to our first example of kind of model we like to use for spaces. If we leave the affine setup, we can move from algebras to DG algebras and maybe to DG categories. And to understand the, the situation, it actually suffices to look at a DG algebra A endowed with a multiplication M and a differential D. And then we can associate to these data a Hochschild complex which is very much like uh, the Hochschild complex of, of an algebra, but now it has two 
dimensions. It's, it's really a bi-complex that is then totalized. And so horizontally, we have Hochschild-type differentials. And vertically, we have differentials coming from the D, from the differential of the, of the DG algebra. So this induces differentials on all these HOM spaces. So it's a nice uh, bi-complex. And if we look at degree two, then this has to give us, then this has to correspond, as I proposed earlier on, to the algebraic structure. And we immediately see that we have many more components around. Uh, so of course, in the in the so I, I colored the, 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 the degree two is in is in color. And so we have there, of course, in the middle um, the D who is in the uh, in the in the spot um, in the spot C11. Uh, and then we have in the spot C02, we have the multiplication. And then there are other components. So if we move down in the green area, we will acquire the natural ingredients of an A infinity structure, which is not so surprising. But if we move up, we arrive in this uh, red spot, which is, if you like, a zero area operation. So it's just an element in A2. And it is a so -called, the so-called curvature, if you like which, if it is present in the structure, uh, it has the effect that the differential no longer squares to zero. So this is something one should pay attention to. Um, and I, on the checklist, I put the first, uh, the first one in red. Uh, because the differential no longer squaring to zero, this has some, some pretty uh, annoying consequences. So it's no longer the case that you can, uh, in a standard way, associate the things we're used to in geometry, like uh, sheaf categories, derived categories. Uh, this becomes much harder. The other two points on the checklist, they are very good. I mean, the Hochschild complex is, again, a B-infinity algebra or a homotopy G algebra. Uh, and realizing all our other requirements, the cohomology it computes is, again, a bimodule X. So this is uh, very nice. What should we do about the curvature? So, um, so I mean, to, to, to give a, a more precise statement, for instance, it, it is not true that the second Hochschild cohomology uh, classifies, for, in, for instance, Morita deformations. This, this does not hold. Uh, if you are unlucky, there are Hochschild classes that you cannot realize in that way. You, you, you're stuck with the curvature. Um, there are approaches to curved DGAs uh, associating derived categories of the second kind due to Positselsky, but in the formation theory, they will not always do the job. So there's still a remaining issue, and I, I will still leave it red on the checklist. Um, there are some approaches in particular cases, though. So for instance, if you start with a scheme, um, well, many schemes are so-called, well, you can call them derived affine because they are, well, derived equivalent to, uh, to a DGA. Um, and then, as, as I explained, this DGA in general may have curved deformations, but for schemes, the situation is not, not so bad. You will often be able to, to get rid of the curvature altogether. And there's also the possibility of taking a step back for a scheme, because after all, we don't have to jump to the, to the derived category. We can, as an intermediate step, take the abelian category of quasi-coherent sheaves, for instance. And then um, it, it so happens that you can reconstruct this abelian category from its linear subcategory of injective objects. And this is a DGA, of course, but it's concentrated in or DG category rather, but it's concentrated in degree zero. And so no curvature problems will occur. And you can actually build an entire deformation theory of, of, of abelian categories um, uh, based upon this, uh, this idea that you are in parallel deforming injectives. And this works, this works well. 
Um, now, uh, more recently, in a, in a joint project with uh, Francesco Genovese, Julie Simons, and, and Michelle Vandenberg, we are extending this, um, this approach. Uh, so we're, we're trying to extend this idea to, to pre-triangulated DG categories with T structures that have enough derived objectives, because that's kind of the basic thing for your category of quasi-coherent sheaves. It's not just any um, abelian category. It's a Grotenleek abelian category. In particular, it has enough injectives, and that's why everything works nicely. So today, I will not talk much further about this, but I want to give kind of a, a, state, of, uh, a state of things. And for the remainder of my talk, I will focus on another model for spaces, which is in some ways very different and in, in other ways similar. And this will be free sheaves of algebras. And this is closer to my very first slide where we had this HKR decomposition. So for a scheme, uh, we had these three components and we could guess pretty well what they should classify. Um, and now on the algebraic level, this is related to deforming the structure sheaf. So what do we know about deforming pre-sheaves of algebras? Well, um, already back in the 1980s, Gersenhaber and Schack developed uh, this theory. And uh, they defined a complex, again, totalization of a double complex, um, which well, is closely related to pre-sheaf deformations. So it's called the Gersenhaber-Schack complex, and I have written it there. So it's a formula where you see uh, ingredients that resemble very much uh, Hochschild complex ingredients. So again, there are linear maps taking multiple inputs and one output. But now um, you see there's a product over uh, simplicious in the underlying category over which the pre-sheaves li li live. So, so this is a pre-sheaf A with this, this uh, particular font uh, on my slides, and it's, it's over a small category U. And so in this U we can look at uh, simplicious, so N simplicious are uh, an N, an N simplex is just N consecutive composable morphisms. And so now these will enter into the picture of the complex. And so we look at linear maps where they start in the, the algebra associated to the codomain, T of sigma, and they land in uh, the algebra associated to the domain of sigma, S sigma, yes? And so, um, again, we have a double complex, and now this looks, uh, there's a formal uh, resemblance between this one and the, and the one for DG algebras, in that, again, we have a, a, a structure, an, an original structure with two components, but now it's an, an M. The M is, again, multiplications, and these are the multiplications of all these different algebras featuring in, in the diagram, in the pre-sheaf. And then the F, it stands for the restriction morphisms. Yes, so for, for every uh, morphism in my underlying uh, round U category, I have a restriction morphism in the opposite uh, direction. And these are denoted by the letter F. And then again, if we look at the degree two part, I, I, I put colors again. Um, now, this time it's in the first quadrant, so it's, we're just talking about three components. But you see, again, there is an additional component, and it, it, it's in the same spot. It's in the two zero spot. It's again a zero area operation, and it will correspond to the, uh, it will be a kind of twist, and it will correspond to these uh, jerby deformations I mentioned in the very beginning. So let's have a closer look. Um, let's have a look at our checklist. So the components are for the moment in red uh, because, well, it's, it's not true that pre-sheaves deform into pre-sheaves. Um, but, well, as we will we'll see in a minute, 
the situation is pretty good. Um, we can remedy this without too much trouble. Um, and then the complex, well, Hirsten and Brinshek, they, they obtained this complex just by resolving uh, in the first argument, uh, the pre-sheaf as a bimodule, they have a particular resolution, and then this this brings on the complex, and it also brings on this cohomology, which is then of course an X group. So that's nice, but it, it's not enough yet for our uh, elementary deformation uh, wish list, if you like. So the cohomology is, is very good, though, because. Um, it, it recovers this, this scheme Hochschild cohomology uh, very, very, uh, very nicely. All you have to do is take the structure sheaf of the scheme and restrict it to a nice affine cover. And then, then you're computing that cohomology. And actually, uh, Gersten, Haber and Schack already in the 80s, uh, they, uh, they, they knew that that's what you had to do. I mean, they were motivated by the HKR theorem in proposing this this definition, actually. So now, um, now let's try to solve the first red piece, the component. There's something wrong with the components, and it becomes more clear when we take a more categorical point of view. Namely, let's, uh, let's look at pre-stacks rather than pre-sheaves. So let's take values in categories rather than algebras. Uh, then it becomes a little more clear what this additional component really is. So the multiplications, we know they are, uh, they are just more multiplications on individual categories, so they are compositions on categories. The restriction morphisms are just functors between those categories. And then the twists, well, they are natural transformations. And they are natural transformations expressing that, in general, um, there's no functoriality. So I shouldn't have said functor. I should have said uh, it's something that wants to be a functor, but the twists express that it's not quite. Um, these twists, they go from a composition V star U star. So yes, so let me explain the picture. So we have, a, a we have two composable arrows in U. We have V followed by U on the left-hand side of the screen. And then to restrict, we can either do it in two steps, first restricting by U, then restricting by V, or we can do it at once. And the difference between the two is measured by the twists. And it's a natural transformation, and usually we speak about the pre-stack when these natural transformations are invertible. But for all of the talk, I will ignore this issue completely. So when you read pre-stack, you should really think it's a lax functor, or, or I mean, it's a, it's a pre-stack, but without, without requiring a priori these natural transformations to be invertible. Um, so let's look at the Hochschild complex. What changes? Because of course, so first of all, maybe I should say, why is it not bad to change, to, 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 to broaden our view to include pre-stacks? Well, from the non-commutative geometry deformation theory point of view, it's pretty much okay because, for instance, to such a deformed pre-stack or twisted pre-sheaf, if you like, you can associate nice abelian categories. You can def define, for instance, quasi-coherent sheaf categories by gluing uh, affine pieces, if you like. You, you can pretty much uphold uh, the geometric picture. And now what happens to the, to the complex? What, what happens technically? Technically, things become a bit more complicated. So, um, because you see these twists, if you start with a pre-stack, you have to incorporate them. So yes, what do I want to say? If we, if we allow pre-stacks, we should also be able to define a Hochschild complex for a pre-stack. We're not just going to always start with pre-sheaves and deform them into something more general. That, that's not, not, not fine by point one. In the, in the wish list. So we now have to define a Hochschild complex for a pre-stack. And so then we have to incorporate in the formula, you have to look on the right hand side, um, where these maps, where these linear maps, they, they, again, they have 
multiple arities, we won't discuss the domain, but the co-domain is interesting because they have to land somewhere that should be able to encode the twists. And so we need to go, I mean, for, for a fixed object, let's say, that lives on one level of the, of, the, of the diagram, we have to be able to compare restricting in two steps or restricting in one step. And so we build this into the complex. It's a slightly more involved definition, uh, but it still uh, resembles very much the original Kirsten Abramschak definition. But now when we want to endow this with a, with a differential, uh, things become quite a bit more complicated. You, you, you will no longer suffice, uh, it will no longer suffice to consider the Hochschild and the simplicial differentials. It's no longer a double complex, it becomes a twisted complex, and you have to define all these additional uh, differentials. But it can be done, and so far, uh, so far, so good. And so, yes, let me, so the, the structure lives in degree two, and now the next observation is that the axioms for a pre-stack, they live in degree three. Uh, one by one, you can, uh, you can write them down, uh, associativity of the multiplications, um, functoriality of f. Yes, the, f, the f's are functors, of course, but the entire a is not a functor, so I, I said something, something wrong earlier on. Um, naturality of c uh, is encoded in c21, uh, and then there's finally a coherence axiom, uh, which is encoded in the c30 component of the complex. So these four components in degree three, they nicely uh, represent the axioms of a pre-stack. Um, there is one thing, however, that is slightly worrying. If you think back about the Mar cartan equation earlier on, it took the form m dot m equal to zero, or you can spell it out with the Gerstenhaber uh, bracket, it amounts to the same thing. Uh, and what's essential is that this is quadratic, of course, in, in the structure. And this is not the case here. I mean, clearly, it's, these, 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 uh, these formulas are not, uh, are not homogeneous, are, not, uh, are certainly not quadratic. The number of occurrences of the structure in one single piece of the expression, it ranges from two to four. And so um, what can we do? Because this is an obstacle for defining higher structure, clearly. We already had trouble with the differential, and now we are getting more trouble with the higher structure. And one approach to remedy this is by forgetting for a moment about the pre-stack and turning it into something that we know much better. And this can be done by applying the Grotendieck construction. So we put everything together in one, uh, in one category or category type object. And it's a construction that is formally uh, exactly the same as Grotendieck's original construction, which of course expresses the famous equivalence between pseudo functors on the one hand and fibered categories on the other hand. But somehow Gerstenhaber and Schack, they already put forth this construction for algebras. They didn't call it the Grotendieck construction, but that's what they did. Uh, they associate an, a single algebra, A shriek, to our uh, pre-stack A. And, um, and then they, they, they prove that they have a, a, a big theorem, the cohomology comparison theorem, which, which was proved in several stages, um, proving that x over the pre-sheaf on the one hand and x over this single algebra on the other hand, uh, actually coincide. And then with, with uh, Mich Michel van den Berg, we, we generalize this to the pre-stack case uh, with, a, with, a, with very different proof. Um, and then uh, this doesn't tell us anything about the structure of the complex yet. And then the next step is that with Hoang Din Van, we actually um, worked on the level of the complexes to, to build, well, a quasi-isomorphism between these two complexes, but it turns out to be much nicer, it turns out to be a homotopy retract. And so this allows you, at least in theory, to transfer quite a lot of higher structure 
from from the, the algebra to the the pre sheaf and so you could say, okay, here we're we're done. We, we have what we want. We, we we can transfer, in particular, an L infinity structure, and that's that's what we that's what we put forward, right? Um, but it's not easy to to write down or to get any insight in this L, L infinity structure from this transport. I mean, well, you you have to start somewhere transporting, and in any case, we haven't. We haven't pursued that approach to use the transfer to get insight into the into the L infinity structure. Uh, we started focusing on other more direct approaches, as as many other authors have been doing. So, uh, in many particular cases of diagrams, there are uh, concrete descriptions of L infinity structures. So, for instance, for algebra morphisms. Uh, and then uh, due to Frégier, Markel, and Yao, and then uh, later for other specific diagrams. So for instance, Barmeyer and Frégier, they have an approach for diagrams where essentially they are geometrically relevant, but the whole, uh, the whole problem of composing morphisms in the underlying category does not appear. Um, and then in 2020, there came an operatic approach by uh, Eli Hawkins to the pre sheaf case, where in two steps he constructs an operat uh, acting on the Hochschild complex for a pre sheaf, so not a more complicated one, but the original one. Um, and he endows this with an L infinity structure. And then we adapted this approach to encompass the twists. And so it becomes then yet a little bit more complicated. You start with an operat, you have to change to incorporate a next piece in the structure. And then in the end, we had to turn things upside down in, in Hawking's approach. And then in the end, we had to add uh, the twists. And it works, but still it's not satisfactory. If you compare that with the original approach in Gersenaber Voronov's transparent treatment of the algebra case, I mean, there you just have one single operation and you don't have to split it into individual pieces and adapt an operat uh, to these individual pieces. And uh, we very much uh, wanted to do the same. Um, and so in the remainder of my talk, I will discuss a new um, approach to the L-infinity structure on a pre-stack. It's also an operatic approach, but it's it's different from these uh, these approaches we, we've discussed so far. And so, um, how does this uh, how does this work? What is the inspiration? Um, well, the inspiration is that. Uh, there is, it's well known that there is this uh, N-colored operat, which I will denote by op, um, whose algebras are precisely non-symmetric operats. Yes, so to recall this, uh, the color N corresponds to an N corolla, and then elements of op K, you can depict them as trees with K vertices, and how does this act on the Hochschild complex, for example, well, simply by inserting linear operations uh, with designated arities at the vertices and then composing. So that's not too hard. And our idea, idea is simply to, uh, well, let a similar colored operat act on the Hochschild complex, just one operat. Um, and how are we going to do this? So let me... Uh, start with a story to illustrate the concept. Um, and the story is like this. Uh, suppose you are moving. You have all your stuff packed in boxes, these typical moving boxes. I have a picture of such a box on the screen. Um, all your stuff is packed, but now a problem arises. There is no moving van. You are on foot. And you have to, uh, you, you can carry only one box, just a single box, and you have all of these boxes around you. So that's the bad news. The good news is that these are not ordinary moving boxes. These are boxes with special 
properties. And the special properties are as follows. Um, you can shrink, uh, stretch um, these boxes at will, um, as long as you the end result has to still look like a box. Um, but so you can make them as small as you like. Um, but there's also rules you have to take into account. You, you want to stack these in an efficient way, uh, but there's rules you have to take into account. On top of each box, there's a number. And the number tells you how many boxes I should stack on top. So I can shrink some of these boxes and then I want to stack them on top of another box. But I have to respect these numbers. And there are also drawings on the side. And these have to be respected as well. If I put two boxes aside of one another, where they, where they meet, the drawings should match. So for instance, with these three boxes, I can match the two upper sunflowers and then put these two boxes on top of the box below. This is, this is fine. And so if I'm lucky with, with all my moving boxes in the house, uh, if I'm lucky with the labels, with the labels on the sides, then I can stack all these boxes in, in, in one sim single box. And like the wizard Merlin, I can, I'm ready to go, right? Um, so how does this work in a formal, uh, how do we formalize this? Well, we define an N3 colored operat box op. And a, a, a color, so, so the, the, the colors on the sides of the boxes, in our case, to simplify things, they will also be numbers. Um, and so the, the color PQR is, is a box. It, it's two-dimensional. So our story for the moment is two-dimensional. And so these are the labels on the sides of my box. Um, and then the, the, the operands, um, box op, uh, it's generated by these these uh, these rectangles that I, I put in the middle of the slide, where you uh, insert uh, a number of boxes on top of another one, and then this insertion procedure clearly it satisfies associativity relations, which I've also put a picture there. Okay. Um, so now. Um, Elements of this operand, uh, they can be depicted as end stackings. So uh, you have to be careful about what, what you can do. Uh, so I, I, to be careful, I write allowable stackings of end matching labeled boxes. So here is an example of something that lives in box of four. So there's four boxes. And I've written down the labels. So for instance, in the bottom, we have a zero to zero box. So there are zeros on the side. And these particular boxes, we call them thin, but we still draw them as a box, but we call them thin boxes. And then for instance, on the top of this drawing, there are two, uh, two boxes with zero inputs on top. That is also, uh, designated by the double line. So the double line always means zero inputs. Okay. And now our first uh, result, we show that indeed this operat box op, which is of course inspired by the combinatorics of the Hochschild complex, so it's by no means a surprise, but this operat box op, it acts on an enlargement of the Hochschild complex. You have to make things a little bit more symmetric, uh, not too symmetric, but concerning the sides, you have to allow simplicious both on the left and on the right side of your box. So there's not just the sigma simplex, there's also a tau simplex. And if, if, you, if you look at the very right end of the formula, you see these two simplicious uh, working on uh, on objects, yes. Uh, and so, okay, of course, how does the how does our box op now act on this enlargement of the Hirschenaber-Shaka complex? Well, 
uh, it's designed to do this, right? So it works by inserting linear maps into rectangles and then composing. So these maps here, uh, M could be a multiplication map as we had before, uh, and F could be a restriction map, C could be the twist we had before, and the, the, the composition we're making here, it is a piece of information that features in the coherence axiom. If you remember this axiom, I had this list of four axioms, uh, and this is a part of the coherence axiom. So now this works, and then um, now we have to use this to build an L-infinity structure. And here things become, uh, become technically uh, technically more challenging. Um, so I will not give many details here, but if we restrict to suitable stackings, which upon composition reduce the number of thin boxes by exactly one, uh, we can use those to define what we can call an n Gersenhaber dot. So it's like, it, it's like you wanted to have the dot, right? But now you need to add more components and you, def you can define them using these stackings. And then you can define an n Gersenab bracket uh, as anti-symmetrization. And then our main result is that we construct, we, well, we have a morphism of DG operats from uh, L infinity to box up. So uh, this indeed endows this enlargement of the Hochschild complex with an uh, L infinity structure. And um, let me say a bit more about um, about this these box operats. So um, in fact, I've already said box up, um, but following the analogy with the fact that non-symmetric operats uh, are, are, are the op algebras, this was our inspiration, um, we may call a box op algebra simply a box operat, which is what we do. And uh, box operats, um, they have, have appeared. In fact, they are instances of a concept that goes way back, uh, multi-categories over monads, um, and they have been considered in particular uh, by Leinster under the name of FC multi-categories. And they have also been called uh, virtual double categories in other work. So box operads are, well, familiar after all, and so rephrasing the theorem, what we have shown is that every linear box operat B carries an L infinity structure with zero differential levels. And then the Maurer Cartan equation takes, or ex expression uh, takes the following form um, using these higher operations. So now our theorem uh, in terms of the gersen schack complex is the following, um, well, if we endow, uh, if we now, well, we take, a, as we had with algebras, we start with just modules and then we put the structure on later on. And now we have realized our goal of doing this with the entire structure at once, because we can start with a, uh, well, a kind of quiver, a, a U-parameterized quiver, so you should think it's a pre-stack, but you've, you've taken all the algebraic structure away from it. And then you can still write down this Hochschild object, if you like, and you can endow it with this box operatic L infinity structure with zero differential. And then um, the wish from the wish list becomes true for an alpha in degree two, an MFC, uh, we indeed have that. Uh, the maurer cartan equation holds for this alpha precisely when a MFC is a pre-stack. So, uh, and then as a corollary, uh, using the twisting of, of L infinity structures um, by an element, uh, we can now endow the complex with a, with a, with a differential, with a, with a twisted L infinity structure, 
uh, so including non-zero differential, and then this will govern the deformation theory of the principle. So this is uh, the story, um, the story so far. Um, so, so all these uh, all these items are now green. If you um, want to hear more about the details, I would like to point out that if I understand correctly, in two minutes, um, or maybe a, a little bit later, but it, it seems my talk was a bit sh shorter than an hour. Um, so in a couple of minutes, there will be a poster se session and my co-author, Flander Hermans, will be presenting a poster about this work, including some more drawings. And so he can explain some more about the details of this approach. Uh, and he will also be giving a seminar talk later on in the program, if I'm not mistaken, on June 5, um, about this work. Um, so with all, the green, uh, with all the green items, it looks like the story is finished, but that is, of course, not true. This is just because I, I put the elementary deformation setup, which is kind of the minimal thing you want for deformation theory. And this we now realized, uh, this we understand, but of course we want to relate this to, to other approaches um, that also, um, well, for instance, I mean, I've listed two goals, two future goals uh, that are work in progress. Um, so one thing we are looking into is to understand really exactly how the linear conjecture for pre-stacks works, uh, because probably in between the box operands and the L infinity structure, uh, you can write down, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite clear how to write down higher versions of the higher braces in the B infinity structure. And so you should be able to write down a nice algebraic structure that um, gives you uh, something equivalent to the chain little disk operand. Uh, and then another line of research that is really Lander's project is to develop causal duality for, for box operands. Um, so this is, uh, this is what I wanted to, to tell you. So, um, well, I'm finished at exactly at five. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you. I can hear you. Um, 